Okay, so um, Dave Heffernan, welcome to uh, Perfect Health on Elastic FM with Elaine Godley. Lovely to um, to speak with you. You too. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, so um, there's a there's an awful lot to, to talk about. I'm not quite sure where to start, but um, I think I'll pick um, your job title. You you class yourself as a survival coach. So can you explain to the listeners uh, what it, what is a survival coach? A survival coach is somebody who, um, it's like, I don't like the word life coach, I don't like the word business coach. Um, and we're living in a society now where people are surviving. You know, they're not thriving, they're not living, they are surviving. And so my job is basically to get them out of survival mode and into relaxed mode and actually getting some hope and seeing that hope and actually making real um, the goals and the dreams that they've got. You know, so when you're in survival mode, you can't see the positivity and, you know, the future in, in front of you, a positive future in front of you. So my job is to make real their goals and the dreams that they had before it was in survival mode. So what kinds of um, things do people come to you with? What sort of challenges do they have? Um, quite a few. Mainly I work with um, people who've got anxiety, depression, um, I've in the last week alone, I've had four people who have presented themselves suicidal. Oh, goodness me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm getting known as somebody who helps people who are suicidal, um, which is, you know, is a, is a big pressure to have. And I've got good links with uh, various charities and where I can signpost people if I've not got time to really put into them. Um, so I made some really good connections over the 25 years that I've been volunteering and doing uh, voluntary work. Um, but yeah, the last seven days I've had four people who have been suicidal who have helped turn it around. So I keep hearing this again and again and it seems um, the stories that I'm, I'm getting is uh, young men in their mid-twenties seems to be um, a, a popular time uh, of, of life. Because there are, as you say, there's so many stresses and strains. In fact, on, on my show this week, uh, my guest wasn't able to come along because she had a family member had committed suicide. So, you know, it, it seems to be on the radar, you know, again and again. It's very sad. So um, when you mentioned you've been volunteering for 25 years. So what, what have you been volunteering um, to, to do and when, what, what capacity and who, who with? It's been a mixture. I've um, fundraised and worked with pre and postnatal depression charities. Um, the last one being Pandas, um, based in the Midlands, uh, which is a national charity um, helping men and women. Uh, I was in charge of the men's section, um, but also I did a lot of work with the women's side as well. Um, because more recently, it's actually been shown as men actually having postnatal depression which was always poo-pooed and ignored. Mm. And now evidence is coming that men are actually um, going through postnatal depression as well. And also PTSD is a big thing um, when the births are quite traumatic. Um, and so men are going through a lot of emotional issues there. I've done work with um, crisis, um, action for children, you know, so um, more recently, I'm involved with a company, uh, with an organisation called CEO Sleepout, which is a national uh, charity that is supporting um, homelessness, poverty, um, and sex work charities across the UK. And every year, I do um, a sleepout, a charity sleepout. And last year in Manchester, we raised sixty-four thousand pounds, which went towards four northwest charities, Manchester charities. Good gracious me including Man uh, MASH, which is Manchester Action for Sexual Health, the Mustard Tree Foundation, um, you know, so, some fast, fantastic charities that are getting real money at the front line where they need it and actually making real differences to people's lives. So, That's amazing. You mentioned CEO sleep out. Is that CEOs as in business people? Yeah, it's business leaders um, across the UK who basically get away from the suits in the office and actually try to understand what it's like actually being out there on the street and so it's um, circumstances so you know this year we'll be at the Lancashire Cricket Club for myself um, at Old Trafford but it, it's, it's one of the few charity fundraisers that I do that genuinely I can empathise and understand 
with why we're raising the money for. You know, I've done the skydives, I've done the marathons, I've done the, you know, the, the war. These things to do, and they're good bucket list things to do, but there's no real connection to the actual reason why you're earning that money. And so for these sleep outs, you know, it's life changing for a lot of these business leaders to actually spend a night. You know, last year was in the middle of Storm Doris, and oh, it was absolutely it was absolutely bitter. And you know, the stands were you know flying. There was stuff flying over us, and it was just crazy. You know, and that's just for one night. Mm. You know, and they had a real empathy and understanding what people are actually genuinely going through, and so it makes them want to raise more money and get more involved and start. I mean, a bit more of a corporate responsibility towards homelessness as well. That's so, very good. And, and what, what is your connection then to the, the homeless charity? Uh, my connection, basically, I was homeless for two years when I was 16. Um, and during that time, um, I set up a childcare club and got me A-levels while I was living rough above a drug dealer's squat. Uh, I'm in a cemetery for three months in disused masonettes. Wow. Um, but I had, I had a mission. Um, I grew up in a place called Salford and council estate called Oddstall, which was one of the roughest council estates in the whole of Europe. Um, and from a very, very early age, I had a big moral compass. I could see what was around me and I could see the problems and the troubles and I wanted to stay clear of that. But I wanted to try and help the people around who needed the help. And so me and my father had different ideas about where I should be going. And he wanted, me, he wanted me to become an accountant. And I wanted to actually be a volunteer and stay in Salford and make it a better place. And the arguments were quite, you know, vicious over a course of a couple of years from the age of about 14 to 16, where I was digging my heels in saying, this is what I want to do. And at the age of 16, when it was, he was legally responsible to be able to do it, he said, get out, I'm not interested. Um, and so I didn't have a plan B. You know, back then in 1990, there was no internet. There was no signposting. Um, like now you could become homeless and you know you can just go to the internet on the live and you could find out all the resources and has all that's out there. I had nothing like that. But my plan A was to get this childcare club up, set up. And so I, I ended up on the street for just under two years whilst trying to develop this childcare, trying to get money for, for this childcare club. And for about eight months, I didn't get a single yes. I was knocking on doors of offices. Banging on, I was still in the same clothes that I had been in for two, three months. And, you know, looking back, I couldn't understand why they were saying no. Um, and then fortunately, I met a guy whose job was to try and get people into YTS, the old youth training scheme. Mm -hmm. And I explained, said, no, this, this is what I want to do. I don't want to go into youth training scheme. And rather than tell me to go away then, because he had his own targets, he actually sat with me and developed a business strategy and a business plan. Wow. And he actually supported me. Um, and amazingly enough, for about two months after that, I got over 25 yeses and managed to get it aside. You know, so a bit of a plan instead of just banging on doors saying, gimme, 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 you know, it's, uh, it worked. You know, but I've had a few of those sliding doors moments where, and this is what's driven me over the years, is it's important to just listen. And he listened to me. And rather than put his own objectives on me, and his own morals, he actually listened to what I needed and he supported me. And, you know, I can trace, you know, my career now back to him. Wow, amazing, isn't it? And, it, and with, the, with the CEO um, sleep out thing you were saying, um, I'm just closing down some uh, things. I've, I had something just pop in just now. I don't want to be distracted. Um, the, the CEO sleep out, um, Again, I wonder how many CEOs have been inspired by, by you know, what you've created there. It's just it's remarkable. So never say never. Just keep on and having the passion and belief that you can achieve. It's, it's, it's a great story. Well done. Excellent. And is that child centre um, support thing still going up in Belford? It lasted two and a half months. I, put, I handed the keys over to the council because I was emotionally drained. Yes. I said I took it as far as I could. My mission was to get it up and running and sorted. The council didn't have my passion, my why, my belief. Yeah. They just wanted to regenerate Salford from the business side of things. And so within two months, two and a half months, it folded. So the lesson there, see things through right to the very end, not yeah. just to where you believe. 
yeah. the end is, you know. So, but I can't regret that, you know, because from a very early age, I was um, an altar boy at the age of five. I served at Catholic Church, and my primary school, because I was very good at reading, they thought I would be good on the altar. Mm-hmm. And so at the age of five, I actually served my very first funeral, which is not normal, you know, for a five-year-old to be mm-hmm. there with a big coffin in front of them yeah. with all these you know, emotional people. Yeah. And between the age of five and the age of eight, um, I'd served over 300 funerals. Good grief. Now, at the age of eight, something incredible happened. Um, and again, this is another sliding doors moment that's really sort of built my own personality and my character is... I became an unofficial grief counsellor. People you would just, just okay. people would just sit, mm-hmm. people would just sit next to me, and just pour the heart out. And I just sit there with me altar boy clothes on, my cosser and cossack, and I just listen. And all I kept on hearing was regret. Mm-hmm. I wish, I wish I would have spent more time with them. I wish I would have phoned them. I wish he would have done what he wanted to do before he died. And again, talking about sliding doors moment and people listening i went up to the priest and i've got a seven-year-old now and he would never ask this question he'd be more interested about you know what's happening with a youtube star yeah um but i asked the priest said look he said how do i live a life of no regret now again that's not normal for an eight-year-old no it was normal to me though because that was the, the environment that i was growing up in And the priest, rather than sort of slap me and say, go away, he actually said to me, he said, to live a life of no regret, Dave, you need to make peace with your decisions immediately, both good and bad. Yeah. And I can tell you now, from the very moment I walked out of that church as an eight-year-old, and I'd served for another eight, nine years after that, and so I've I've actually served over three and a half thousand funerals. Good grief. Um, So I'm very comfortable around death and grieving and grief and, you know, that kind of thing. And I know a lot about regret. but from that moment on, every decision I made, whether that's got me into a, a horrible situation, I've had several death threats, um, or homeless, I've always made peace with the decision that I've made because A, I've either made it with a sound mind, so therefore I've had all the facts in front of me, it can't be a bad decision, it was, you know, it was right at the time. And if I wasn't of sound mind, which was very rare, how can I regret something that wasn't a sound mind? Mm, yeah. I wasn't in control. And so that has taught me so much and helped me so much stay for all these years extremely content. And that's something that a lot of people strive for. And this is what I help people towards. Once they can understand that they can make peace with the decisions and move on, learn from it, grow, it's so much easier to then to get mm-hmm. that life of contentment. Absolutely. So that's so that's all part of your work as a survival coach. That is remarkable. Yeah. Um, I I wasn't brought up in a, a Catholic church. I, I don't understand what you mean by serving. I've got an Im- right. imagine uh, uh, image in my mind, but uh, what 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 is serving? Uh, basically, it's just helping the priest throughout the service. Um, so you have the mass, and at the funeral, obviously, you got the coffin, and the priest does the prayers and. You know, it does his bit, and I'm there with the um, the wine and the bread, giving communion to people, um, helping the priest with his little jobs that he needed to do. Right. Okay. So it's basically being a mini priest. Right. With background. Goodness me! At the age of five, five to eight years old, remarkable. Okay, well, you've got another remarkable story, Dave. Um, a little bird tells me you have a, a couple of um, quite serious health conditions that you're you're dealing with. Yeah, people seem amazed when I go to meetings and I'm looking, although a little bit fat now, but a little bit, you know, healthy. Um, I've actually got um, a rare form of motor neural disease um, and a severe lung defect. I've got a paralyzed diaphragm and I'm currently on 31% vital lung capacity. Um, and I was diagnosed with that just short of four and a half years ago. Um, and when I was being diagnosed, when I was getting all the uh, the tests done, I was under five different consultants. I was under a neurologist, I was under a lung consultant, I was under a urologist because I was incontinent, um, I was under an audiologist because my hearing for some reason was gone. And I genuinely can't think who the fifth one was. I think it was just get feeling a bit left out. 
-hmm. genuinely i can't remember what he did yeah. but he just happened to be there in some of the meetings um and what they was doing they was medicating for their own particular field mm -hmm. and so the tablet and the medication was getting completely concocted and there was no communication between the two different consultants so I, I was on 36 tablets a day plus 45 milligram morphine and i was in agony i was in pain but i you know without going into too much detail i was vomiting every day quite violently um, I was getting massive headaches. I couldn't get off the settee. You know, I kept on hearing the word no to my children. They wanted to play football. They wanted to do a jigsaw. And all I kept on saying was no, 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 because I couldn't physically do it. Um, and that was sort of the main point where I said enough's enough. Because once you hear no too many times, especially to see children, I didn't become a dad to say no to my kids and not actually do the basics with them. And so I educated myself about the tablets that I was taking and I realized that the vast majority of them were counteracting the others and but adding side effects. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite a black and white person, you know. Um, and so I said to my wife, I said, look, I'm coming off all my tablets because in my mindset, I would rather be in pain and drug free than be in pain with a lot of drugs in my system and have a lot of side effects. And so it was a simple decision for me. You know, I'm not advocating nobody should do this. So you need to speak with the doctors. But it was a very simple decision for me to take. And my wife was thinking, oh, you're going to die in a week or two weeks. And what are we? I said, keep the faith. You know, when you educate yourself, you realize that the body is designed to heal itself. Mm -hmm. If you fuel it right, if you feed it right, the body is there. to just, You know, it's an incredible machine, your body. And I think we don't pay it enough justice and enough sort of respect. Um, what the hell goes on inside of us mm -hmm. is beyond most people's comprehension. And over about 10 days, I had the, the worst time. But then I thought, I'm having the worst time anyway with the tablet, so I'll ride through it. And after 10 days, I started feeling better, started losing weight properly and healthily. Um, I started doing more things with the kids. And now I'm living a life. My neurologist actually calls me freak. <laughs> Whenever I see him now, and he's, so, he's not discharged me, but we sort of have a bit of a catch up. Yeah. every sort of eight to twelve months and he welcomes me as hi freak you know what i mean he knows obviously i'm not going to sue him for that yeah. Uh, yeah but i said well it's not difficult i said you're trained in medicine you're not trained in the other stuff so if you you know if you're not trained in that other stuff why would you want to look into it That's i've looked into it yeah but that is so important um to to um, highlight that 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 um situation the medics do what they can within their training and yeah. they're trained to cut, burn or poison us. They don't know anything else, do they? Exactly. And when you have a, a diagnosis that's not, not nice and um, all the time I, I end up helping people with, they've just been diagnosed with cancer and very often, you know, they've been told they've got so many weeks to live or they've got, you know, go home and put your affairs in order and all this sort of thing and, and, and the stress and, and, you know, they're, they're either on the ceiling or on the floor and I'm sort of scraping them off the ceiling or picking them up off the floor. And once they realize that actually that means that they're now in control. And as you say, when you're in control of your own health and well-being, and you get to know your own body, it's remarkable. You yeah, help yeah. it to be in the situation where it heals itself. It will do. So you came off, you came off 36 tablets and you're now drug free. No drugs. I won't even say painkillers. I use, I use different methods. I have mindfulness. I meditate. You know, I drink plenty of water. I try and eat healthily. You know, I've slept there a little bit in the recent months. Um, but I try and look at what I'm putting into my body um, a lot better. Um, there's always room for improvement. But, you know, ultimately, the mind is such a powerful tool. You know what I mean? And using that rightly, you know, keeping positive, keeping focused having the mindfulness practice and, you know, the meditation is massively helping, especially with pain. Yes. You know what I mean? It just eradicates that completely for me. Um, and just seeing my kids smile, you know, after this interview, I'm going to be going out there and I'll be having a bit of a play around with them. Garden. You know, why would I not want to carry on doing what I'm doing? Yeah. If that's what it's giving me. You know what I mean? I'm a dad again. You know, that's all I want. Fabulous. So, so your message then is one of belief. Believe in, believe you can. There's always an, an alternative way for for anything and everything, and um, don't give up. Um, and um, sort of take control of your own situation. Take control and educate. You know, we need to educate ourselves. 
you know and once we do you know and you've got that open mind i would say be open-minded you know what i mean because this kind of language is so new to a lot of people it's almost like woo woo yeah you know what i mean it's far too you know big to comprehend mm -hmm. so have an open mind and try you know what i mean try eating healthily try drinking the water try mindfulness try meditation it's not going to do you damage you know what i mean and so if you're already feeling damaged it's only going to help or just keep it the same but i think you'll find once you do it properly and consistently actually things will get slowly better for yourselves and then that's when the belief comes in you know borrow somebody else's belief before you've got your own i think that's important be open-minded and borrow somebody else's belief absolutely so um how do people get hold of you dave uh several ways you can either get me on linkedin which is under dave heffern and speaker okay um on my website which is dave heffernan.com and it's heffernan yeah h-e-f-f-e-r-n-a-n -E so dave heffernan okey doke um and um how do you help do you pick do you kind of meet with people do you do things on zoom or over the internet how do, how do you do your survival coaching it depends where they are in the country um i like zoom because you can see you know you can see the color of their eyes you can see you know inside the soul basically um zoom's fantastic i do phone calls if they're local or you know i can i can go i go across the uk you know, I'm doing a lot at the moment, let's say, with um, corporates where I'm putting in mental health policies in place um, for their companies and what have you. So I'm in the process as well of setting up a charity because what I'm finding is um, 25 years pretty much doing voluntary work on the side. When you start having to charge people, that's hard for me. And I've had to do a lot of work on myself to actually start charging. And um, so what I'm, what I'm doing with a business partner is we're setting up a community interest company mm -hmm. and that will mop up all the people who have fell out of the system or can't get access to mental health support through postcode lottery or finances or wherever it may be. And that will then fund those people to come through and mop those up. And then the ones who can afford, obviously, I work one-to-one -one with them. Um, yeah, so it justifies being having to charge people. Yes. As I say, naturally, a lot of corporates now are falling into place because mental health is a big thing in the workplace now. Um, and because my brand's quite strong out there now, people are getting in touch with me. Yes. So I work with them. So the CIC, at least, I'm not letting those people down, you know, who can't afford access. There's no postcode lottery for me. You yes. Know, it should yeah. be eradicated, postcode lotteries. Especially mental health support anyway. Absolutely. Okay. I normally ask people to um, suggest two songs um, when they're interviewed that I can play on the radio. Do you have two songs to suggest? Uh, yes. Uh, one's my anthem, which is Elvis Presley, Walk a Mile in My Shoes. Okay. Yeah. And the other one, I have difficulty with this one. Um, I would say... It would be you two and uh, kite. It's called kite. You two kite. Okay, so you two kite and Elvis Presley walk a mile in my shoes. Well, it's been lovely um, speaking with you, Dave. Getting to know a bit uh, more about you, other than bits and pieces I see on Facebook. So <laughs> I'll continue to follow your uh, progress with interest. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you.